for, for anyone that didn't study our bios and um, don't really know much about our backgrounds, we'll do that pretty briefly. But um, I started at the end of May here, so I haven't been here all that long, relatively speaking. Prior to that, uh, I was in Virginia for 10 years. My wife and I farm there. Um, we had a multi-species grazing system, not too dissimilar from what we're doing here. Um, had a store in town and direct marketed meats and um, all of that. So we kind of shut that down and then moved up here for this opportunity at the end of May. And I also started in May. Um, prior to this, I was living out in California, getting my master's in international ag development, focusing on soils. Um, and I had farmed organic vegetables before that, but in grad school really started to learn the connection between the animals and improving our landscape. So that's what landed me here. Okay, so uh, before we dive in, a precursor is I'm not really a slide person. Um, I like kind of more interactive discussions and not everyone have their head down and just writing down what's on the slide. So a lot of the information is just going to be verbal and please feel free to answer questions um, at any time. Sometimes questions throw off my train of thought so it might take me a second to gather myself again, but please feel free to speak up when anything comes up. Um, we have a three hour marathon session, so I think we'll take a break like an hour-ish, hour 15, um, and then come back in here for a little bit again and then hopefully save a little bit of time to go out in the field and see some of the practical applications of what we're talking about answer more questions, and then we also have a pasture walk, a dedicated pasture walk again this afternoon, if anyone, if that runs short, or if anyone wants to see that again. Um, so all of the slides are mostly photos, and the photos are kind of talking points for everything we're gonna go through, and we're fortunate that my wife is a photographer, so all of the photos are hers, um, except for two, and you'll be able to pick those out pretty easily, <laughs> that are mine. Okay, um, so to dive into it, we have uh, like, Leah and I said we both started here in May, and that was in conjunction with um, sort of an expansion of the center and a grazing program of the center. Prior to this year, there was roughly 40 acres-ish um, in pasture, dedicated pasture that they had for an operation that was mostly sheep. Um, so this year, we expanded the sheep flock up to um, about 90 ewes. We brought in a Katahdin flock in addition to the Shropshires and Finn Dorsets. Um, we also expanded into cattle, which I don't think has been done here before. Um, so we went from 40 acres to about 320 um, with the expansion. I'll get into what that expansion means as well. Um, the, uh, the, okay. um, the, the cattle that we're working with, we had about 35 this year. Um, we're going up to closer to 80 or 90 for next year. Um, and then we also have goats as a part of our grazing program too. Um, the stock is a little bit heavier on sheep and cattle. We'll, um, we will cover goats at the end, and then Leah and Phil are doing a talk tomorrow as well on sheep and um, sheep, pigs and ducks and goats. That'll be a little bit more thorough into the goat program too. But don't hold back anything if there's anything you want to ask or know about that. Um, so to give you some um, idea of what you're looking at here, this is actually it's a. Uh, this isn't one of Molly's photos, but um, it's, it's just a, a screenshot of a program that we use called Pasture Maps, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but this is a good visual of what we're working with and how spread out we are. So we are right around there. Um, and then everything that you see in green that's circled in white are, are pastures that we have access to or that we can use. So I, I said it's about 320-ish acres. It's variable because there's some pockets of pasture that um, we can use sometimes, not all the time. Those are owned by New York State. Um, they were a part of a farm owned by David Rockefeller. When he passed away, he bequeathed that land to the state, and then Stone Barns is leasing that from the state. So we have um, a pretty thorough conservation action plan um, that goes through about different management philosophies and things that we have to do to uphold that agreement. Um, but this was all a part of a farm called Hudson Pines, which David Rockefeller owned, and then we are now managing with our ruminants. Um, so it is fairly spread out. There's, I mentioned the acreage, um, what we expanded from. It's connected through, it's like 45 miles of carriage trails. Um, and all the carriage trails sort of, they're loops and circles. So it can take a while to get from one corner of the farm to the other. There's a few miles there that separate it. Um, so we do, some of the moves that are consecutive will walk animals, other moves that are longer will trailer. So there's a bit of uh, you know, logistical um, transportation that we're working through and this is a, a big feeling out year to feel out processes and um, you know things that we were trying and management philosophies and things like that but it was, it was a good year to get into that and try it and regroup and really plan hard for next year since both of us 
that are managing the rumen and sort of started after the grazing season already started. So it was, uh, you know, we weren't forced into any particular program, but we're able to come in and um, kind of make it our own, which was nice. Anything you want to add? Um, no, not on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so the state park in total is about 1,400 acres, um, and that sort of, oops, paper's in the way, comes from there-ish, loops around there-ish. Um, so that it's mostly wooded, and all the, most of the open acreage is what we have access to. Um, there's some of the limitations or... Um, you know, things that we have to work with is, I think that a lot of producers have to work with is infrastructure, which include fencing and water and um, all those other things. We have limited water access. Um, there's wells that we can hook into that are obviously where we are by the center here. There's water over here. Um, and then in these fields over here, there's water. Anywhere we, where we don't have secure water, we have um, essentially three 300 gallon totes on a running gear that we haul. We have a 1200 gallon transfer tank that we haul water out to and those totes are connected to stock tanks so it's always on a float system and they always have access to fresh clean water they're never in the creeks or rivers um, it's not something I, I necessarily believe in doing but it's also in the action plan that we exclude uh, livestock from those natural waterways um, yep sure okay is that better yeah okay sorry um, and also another thing I wanted to add about working with the state and on state land um, is the amount of communication that we that is super important for us to be communicating with the state to be communicating with the Rockefellers who all have property here as well especially when we're moving animals around that's a big part of what we have to do too is working with them to make sure it works for them and works for us yeah so there's like as an example there's a, a lot of different parties involved and there's a lot of people that live here that take ownership of the park which is a really great thing we have anytime we move livestock or any livestock related things that will be on the trail system there's a text chain of um, 19 or 20 people that we notify so that's anyone involved with the park um, any of the carriage riders the horse community so they're all notified that we're going to be on a certain section of trail for a certain amount of time um, so it's really like I think as with any farm model relationships and communication are extremely important and in this scenario too just to be as open as possible um, with what's going on because the more you communicate, the more everyone is aware, and then the better the situation that you can be in. Um, next. Okay. So we're, um, you know, our, our philosophy and what we're doing is it's a lot of um, cycles. Everything is cyclical that we look back on. So working with nature's cycles, working with nature's rhythms, and also having the time to um, focus and track what those rhythms and cycles are. So. We, some of the changes that we implemented this year, um, which we'll get more into detail later, we, you know, working in conjunction with cycles, we've shifted our lambing um, into April instead of into, into March so we can lamb outdoors on pasture when grass is starting to come in, matching nutritional planes with the cycle of when the grass is naturally um, growing. So we're, just this morning we pulled another ram and we have, um, we had four different breeding groups this year um, and we're down to one now, which is exciting to not have six different groups of animals to um, check on every morning. So, um, and what that allows, I think when you get into those cycle programs, it allows for um, time and reflection to pe for people within your team um, to be able to focus and notice those cycles, which if you're trying to force methods and methodology too often, you can get kind of narrow-minded and not see the bigger picture. Um, so the point there and the point with this slide is, is to be able to work with your team um, using those cycles and uh, having that be an important part of your program. Um, and you know, a, a big asset of what, how we farm is how many, we, we our basis of the grazing is to, that, you know, it's a, a short, we're grazing for a short duration on a small piece of land. So a high, a high point of impact for a short period of time. Um, and what that allows is that we're out with the animals all the time. So. I like to say it's a boots on the ground kind of philosophy and we have to take advantage of that management um, to be able to monitor and notice changes within the pastures, changes within the livestock and not to rush through things too much because when you start to rush is when accidents start to happen or you miss an animal that's sick or down that you could have easily seen if you were out with um, the stock and been present in the situation. Um, and also just as important as for um, sort of a check-in with your pastures and your fields is to have, be able to have walks 
and fields ahead of where you're going or fields that you just grazed. You can notice things that you probably wouldn't have noticed if you were up on a tractor or just mowing behind them. So boots on the ground and taking the time to monitor and manage those changes is important and has been important for us. Yeah, and we'll get into it a little bit later when we talk about grazing planning. But also being out there every day allows you to adapt your plan based on what's actually going on. Like we come up with a plan in the beginning of the season, but as the animals start to go through those pastures, we see how, they're, how quickly they're eating everything, and we can make those changes as we're out there. So this, um, this slide, this was uh, Troy Bishop, who came out um, for a program with the apprentices, and those are some of the apprentices, and um, Jack standing there in the background. Um, but getting the team together to, for educational opportunities is also important for us, and something that we um, it's nice for us to take advantage of and um, you know if you're in a position where you have a farm team to be able to do things like that off the farm on the farm but um, you know getting together and be, to be able to share ideas and hear new ideas is important it's easy to get stuck in a philosophy of always having to be on the farm with the same people and not really talking about bigger picture items but you know field days or workshops are a really crucial way to open up your mind and start to, to think about new ideas and new philosophies Okay, anybody know what that is? If you read the top, you know. <laughs> ah, there we go. Okay, um, so this is something that I, I've always used and we um, implement it here at the center. Um, there's so many different formats for these charts, but this is one that I like and I really focus, um, I don't focus much over here in these things, but my focus is up over in this area. Um, how many of you use these currently? Or how many would like to? Or, okay, cool. Um, so they're fairly straightforward, but also very complicated at the same time. So it's a really fun thing to do. Um, everybody see? So uh, this is a, a chart through HMI. I think it's a 11 by 14. You can order them on their website. There's also, I think you can download a copy. There's, I know through I think ranch management consultants, you can order like a three foot by five foot laminated one and hang on your wall the, and use a dry erase marker, which is a pretty cool thing to do. Um, so a quick overview of this is that the months go up here. The pasture, we, all of our pastures are numbered. It's um, whether it's yourself or you're working with 15 people, it's an easy way to reference um, pastures, where you're going, which locations, instead of saying, you know, it's the field across from the big tree by the other big stone. Um, so even if you have one pasture, pasture one, um, we have a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have, it's like 25 or 30, including all the small ones that we can go to. So it's really crucial that we have those numbers to reference um, when we're talking with the bigger groups of the park community as well. The um, pasture number goes in this column, the acreage goes in this column, and all of these little hash marks are days. So if you think like January um, through seven months after January um, is what you could get there. And I, I typically do this for the growing season. Um, it's important to do for the non-growing season too if you're stockpiling pasture um, so you can have an idea of how much grass you have if you need to start to feed hay and when you would need to start to feed hay. I always start these at the end um, I, I typically like to start these at the end and then work my way back. So if you know when your hard frost is, um, you have until then to harvest the grass you want or to leave the grass you want. So if we were to start in, let's say, November and work our way back, um, and the next slide, that will become a little bit more clear, um, which is our example of the chart that we did, which I'll go to. You. So this is not Molly's photo either. Um, so this is our chart. And uh, you can see we have the days up here, and I, I, we said earlier that Leah and I both started in May, so we started ours in June. Um, this is something that's it's good or really important for the team to sit down and do together. Um, yep. Ideally, we have uh, our numbers are really arbitrary. Um, but everyone knows them now, so we left them. So we have like 39s next to 250 for some reason. Um, but we know them now, and it's, it doesn't make sense when we tell people about them, but we know the numbers. But do it make sense if you're, it's, 
it's an easier flow, I think, if the numbers are consecutive and it's, you know, if you tell someone we're going from pasture one to pasture two, it's obvious you're going right next to each other instead of going from pasture 39 to 264. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> Which we don't even have that many pastures. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, so we, um, they're, yeah, they, they're, they're outside 24 hours a day. Um, we have our, you know, sort of a general rule of thumb is we take, um, which Lee will talk about a little bit more later, we take pasture inventory measurements so we know about how many pounds per acre of forage um, is in the field, which we can then backtrack that to say how many pounds of livestock we have um, and then how many pounds those livestock need to eat. So then we can calculate their paddock size. Um, that would be good to do in the paper later, yeah. I think. Um, so yeah, so we, during the growing season, I, I back fence them if they're going to be in a spot for any more than three days because grass starts to regrow within three days. And I don't want them to go back and eat what's coming. Um, so, you know, there's different situations where if they need water access and it doesn't make sense to back fence, but typically we would, they wouldn't have access to the same area for more than three days. They're moved during the growing season twice a day, so which just means that they're given fresh forage twice a day. Does that answer? Yeah, we use Electronet and Polywire. We use we have um, we keep all of our um, the sheep and cattle we keep together, and we have guard dogs. So I would there's like I think this winter we'll work on poly training some of those, but we sort of got here and hit the ground running right away. Um, so we're just using Electronet for the perimeters now, um, just because I worry about dogs getting out and getting on the trail, and we're in a park that has 200,000 visitors annually. Um, so for, for now, for the season that we had, that's the, that was the safest option and the most mobile option, which was able to keep us in the system that we wanted to implement. Um, so, so these charts, I think what is one of the most important things when you sit down to do this chart with your team is communication. Um, when you're talking through these scenarios and the specific scenarios I'll talk about in just a second, but everyone is on the same page with what your goals are, what you're doing, where the animals are going to be, why they're going to be there. Um, the more informed everyone is, the more informed your decision makers are. So it just makes for a more cohesive and collaborative team. Um, I think exclusion like if it was just a manager that would do this and give it to the employee and say, here, um, isn't necessarily the, a great scenario to be in, but the more informed and involved your team can be in this process, um, the more educated they'll become and they'll be able to, in the end, be more valuable employees. Um, these, so what's, it's important to know the flow and the chart of the group and of the animals, but more important is to look at these gaps in between and the rest periods. So I can say for a duration, like the animals are going to be in pasture 40 in the beginning of June for 15 days, but then they're not going to come back again for over 60. So the rest periods are really what's important for putting these charts together to ensure that the pastures are getting enough rest um, and sufficient rest. And I think what we, what we ran into this year is that there were some fields that needed more, some fields that could have stand uh, a little bit less. We were... Some background on this field, which I didn't, on the pastures, which I didn't really get into, is that they were, it was a, a breeding operation, essentially. They, they sold um, simmentals, I think it was, um, and semen and things like that. So they, they managed their pastures well, but it wasn't necessarily, it was a different focus of what they had and what their business was. So a lot of these fields were hayed, set stock, not necessarily rotationally grazed. Um, the, the hay fields have pretty good diversity. Some of the other fields that were stocked heavier have a really heavy nutrient load, um, and so the, the recovery times and regrowth on those were just a little bit different across the board. So we were able to track that, we'll replan for that for next year and have notes um, as we do our grazing plan in the spring again. Um, and we were pretty well spot on this year until we got to like here, um, and some of the regrowth started to slow down. Um, and then so I think we were about two weeks ahead overall, but through the majority of the growing season, we were pretty much spot on to the day um, through our route, which sometimes it works out that way, but that's why you do it in pencil, because it oftentimes doesn't. 
Um, with some of these other things that you can put on here, um, we have lamb weaning dates in there. So we know if there's any specific area of the farm we want to be when we wean, we can plan around that. We also have, uh, yep. Okay. Where, so, you have livestock. So, where do you do you have? Um, how do you keep them in the winter? Okay. Okay. Um, so, for our scenario, we picked a field that was going to be close to where we received the cattle, and that was our starting point. Um, and then from there, I was figuring out a consecutive flow um, to try to make sense of getting around the property. So we started here, um, and then yeah, started there, and then kind of made our way back this direction-ish. Um, so this year, because they've been mowed, the pastures were mowed and hayed so often, we let everything grow. Um, by the time, you know, there were some fields that it was. Um, mid-August by the time they got their first graze it was pretty much just fiber um, and we were able to track that and correlate that with our weight gains on the cattle because they pretty much just sustained for July and August um, and didn't necessarily gain much so there were some areas I would have mowed typically in the spring at green up I'll turn everybody out and give them a big area and move them once a day and I really just want them to get one bite and continue to move on um, I'm not focused on density at all or duration really it's like I sort of think of it as a lawnmower philosophy, like your lawn doesn't really start to grow until you mow it for the first time. Um, a similar thing for grazing. I don't, you don't want to stress the plant too much because everything that's coming up first in the spring is stored energy from what it had over winter. So you certainly don't want to let them overgraze it, but I like sort of the first nip and continue to go throughout the season. Um, two leaves is usually good as far as a growth stage, a two leaf stage, because um, then by the time you would get back around, um, a lot of the plants will be starting to seed out. Um, I typically, I like to get around the whole farm twice in the first month and a half, and then after that assess if we need to do any mowing. So if we were to start, we, we this year we planted some um, annual rye where we're gonna start the cattle, um, so we can start them a little bit sooner, and then kind of evaluate where we're at after that. And once we go through our planning process, we'll um, figure out the route. We're gonna keep the sheep and the cattle separate for lambing this year. Um, and our lambing is focused, there's a red barn up there that we call the lambing barn, but that's where we'll focus um, the group for the majority of the spring. So there's three fields off of that, that total about 60 acres um, that we'll have for the ewes during lambing season, and then close enough access to the barn that we can bring them in. But I think where you start too also depends on your goals. Like we also are looking at conservation and we wanna increase our bird species in the area. So. Like one of the fields, we wanted it to grow for great bird habitat. We had bobo links there this spring, and we wanted to make sure that the habitat was there for them, and we want them to come back next year. So we'll hit that field a little bit later so that that grass can grow up. So our flow also works with those types of cycles as well. Something else that's important that these, uh, I'll get right back to you, um, that these charts are for that I think a lot of us take for granted um, is vacation and time away. That's, it's easy to get in the mindset, and I was for a long time when I started farming, that we're, you know, I'm, I'm not taking any time off. I'm a farmer, and I work hard, and this is what I do. Time away makes you appreciate your farm more, um, and everyone needs sort of a physical and mental reset at some point, whether it's a day or two or two weeks. Um, for when we were in Virginia for the longest time, I thought it wasn't possible because who am I going to train to watch everything when we're gone, and I can't afford to pay someone when we're gone, and... Ultimately, it was just a matter of deciding to do it and then putting things in place to do it and making the time for it. Um, so we had my cousin uh, lived out in Virginia, and you can set animals up in a way. I had a vacation field, essentially. It was a big field with good fencing, and I can say that, you know, everyone's in here. Just make sure there's water flowing and four legs are in the right direction. Um, <laughs> I'll be back in a few days. So, you know, we're... You can be a purist for your grazing philosophy and grazing mentality, but you have to take care of yourself, and time away is uh, a good way to do that. So another reason why this chart is important, and um, we're fortunate that we have a team here um, that's able to support any time when someone needs time off.
but speaking from experience of um, being in a production farm too, that it is doable. So do it. Okay. <laughs> um, Wait, do you have a question, question. back there? Yeah, it's so this year, as we talked about a little bit, it was very fibrous. Um, and you just, you know, you have to know that going in and that that might be a field that they're not going to gain that much and we'll just move them through it quickly um, so that they are trampling it, they are eating it, but we'll get them back to really great forage, you know. And we can also seed with other things so that, you know, underneath that fibrous material will be clover and, you know. I think it's, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh -huh. I'm sure you guys were as well. Yep. So what do you do when you plant it out, but then you get a snowstorm and you can't graze a particular area? Do you go through and do you mow it? Or do you leave it? Why can't you graze it? Well, well now we can't. We had to pick everything up. So we didn't graze it because there was too much snow on the ground. How much snow was there? Um, we got right up to the end of the there. And there's probably some acres, maybe a little bit of snow. Still. So if it, it's my experience, if, if livestock know there's food, they'll get it. So they, and the only problem, the only thing I've ran into is if there's ice, if there's an ice cover over grass and we feed hay. Um, but we had uh, just a dusting of snow so far mm -hmm. this year. But historically, I mean, we've, in Virginia, we've had 18 inch snowstorms and they graze through um, to get the fescue. So another reason why cattle and sheep work so well together is that the cattle will go through um, their heads are buried in the snow up to their ears to graze and the sheep come through in the cattle tracks and kind of clean up behind them. So if the if your infrastructure is set up to where you can do that and there's food there for them, they'll eat it. Um, just so that it doesn't interfere with your management and, you know, depending on how far they are from the barn to get them into milk too. How are you doing water for the We have uh, automatic frost-free waters in the fields that we're dedicating for winter grazing. And so they're they're insulated. Um, water is buried, probably four to five feet. This was all done before we were here, so that's a, a guesstimate um, for how far the water line is buried. But yeah, they're they're insulated frost-free waters, um, and they're they're low enough so the cattle and sheep can both use them. Um, see, I told you what happened. Lose my train of thought. Um, what were we talking about? Grazing plans. Grazing still. plans still. About vacation time. Yep. The last thought. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. It was good, too. I'm certain. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember. You were talking about bubble links. Oh, yeah. And wildlife habitat. Um, so another thing that um, is easy to run into or get in the habit of, if you see grass getting too mature um, to fire up the tractor and get the bush hog out and clip it because it's too fibrous and the cows aren't going to eat it, you're, you're sort of uh, setting yourself up for a one scenario situation. If you go through and clip it, what happens if it turns 90 degrees and you don't get rain for three months? And then you've essentially burned up everything that you were essentially trying to save with clipping out all the fibrous material. So what we found is that if you leave the fibrous material high, it shades the undergrowth. And so you can still have some pretty strong, vibrant, healthy legumes um, underneath some of that old rank fescue orchard grass growth that they won't eat unless they're forced to. Um, they're going to go and eat the good green stuff that's underneath that and that's been shaded and is at a good temperature and protected. Um, and then behind that they're just going to trample all the fibrous material anyways. So let the livestock do the work for you and park your tractor, move fences, um, save on diesel. So and that's that's another scenario where if we're, if we're moving them, um, you know, we can put them in a tighter group and move them more often. If we're in a scenario where we want more trampling um, and more activity, all of their manure and urine is going to get mixed up in that and trampling all that fibrous material and there's going to be good ground cover. If you get a drought, the ground is covered anyways. You've already harvested the forage that you want um, and then it's going to rest for two or three months and by the time you come back to it in the fall, it's going to be beautiful and green again and your tractor is still parked. Okay. That's what, see I told you it was good. That's what it was. Um, Okay, I think that covers grazing planning fairly briefly. Maybe we should go through and do a formula for how to calculate 
forage and animal units and all that? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. You want to do that? Sure. Okay. Um, and we can go through the grazing tether. stick? Yeah, that sounds great. This sort of gets us into the things that we've been monitoring and the data we've been oh, collecting. What? There's one more. Oh. Okay. <laughs> we can start on that, though. <laughs> um, so I, there is some text in here. Um, so why plan, aside from the obvious, I mentioned cohesiveness within your team. Everyone is on the same page. Um, enable your decision makers. If you're the sole decision maker, that's fine. Um, everyone else within your team will at least be more educated and, and know what the heck is happening. Um, delegation, which is really hard for me to do in the beginning because I thought I was the only one that could do everything the way that I wanted. But it turns out other people do things their way, which is great and beautiful. And then you can learn something from that too. Um, Everyone has a voice. Everyone's sitting down at the table to go through the grazing plan, speak up, ask questions. Um, I, I can't stress the collaborativeness enough of that process. Um, every day on the farm is a learning environment. Make time for that. We're, if, you, if you think you like, have perfected a system, then you've almost failed because then you've stopped learning. So continue to learn, continue to ask questions. I love the question why. Why are you doing this? Why does this happen? Why does the pasture look like that? Why did that animal gain weight and this animal lose weight? Um, continue to research and ask questions. If you don't know yourself, find someone that can mentor you and ask that question to. Um, Google and YouTube are great. Um, it's, it's sort of a weird uh, um, dichotomy to be out in the field and have this kind of romantic connection with the earth and the animals, and then you're on YouTube trying to figure out what that bump or lesion is on the hoof of an animal. So um, mm -hmm. technology is cool for that too. Okay. Yep. You said your goals for the season would be something of that different when you start your grazing plan and what's the thing? So I think your the your holistic goal can shift and should shift as your priorities shift. And for us since we have um, so many players within our relationship to establish this action plan that we're working on and so many people that are um, financially, emotionally, and mentally invested in this process, the goals are bound to change because so many people have input over the situation. The overall goal um, should remain fairly constant, but how you get there is what should change. Um, and I think that's why having informed people within your team is so crucial. Um, so more people can speak up and have a voice and have opinions on what those goals should be and going one direction or the other. That make sense? Um, Ready? Okay. Okay. So we talked a little bit about going back to the grazing chart and how we calculate. Um, we have a 26 acre field and what do we, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? So first, what we usually do, we'll say, go and look at how many animals that we have. Um, so throw out an easy number for sheep. That would be easy for math. 200. 200 sheep. Okay. That's a lot of sheep. Okay, how many cattle do we have? 50. 50 cattle. Great. So then sheep eat like 3 to 4% of their body weight a day? Uh-huh. Right? What, so what do the uh, Sorry. sheep weigh? Oh, we're going to sheep that way. Let's say so each sheep weighs 100 pounds. Times 100. What does each cattle weigh? Let's say, what's easy? 1,000. 1,000. Great. So we've got 20,000. 2,000? God, can't do math. <laughs> 20. <laughs> and 50,000. Okay, great. Then they eat about 4% of their body weight. So times 0 0.04. Cattle, 3? 2 to 3? Mike? Uh, a finishing animal is 3.5%. Okay, so we'll do that. Somebody? I got it. Uh, yeah. This would be, so, uh, sh this is sheep. It's, it's a percentage of Cattle. food they need to consume based on their body, their body weight. weight. So like a lactating ewe or a growing lamb needs to eat 4% of their body weight. A growing steer or a lactating cow needs to eat about 3.5% of their body weight a day. Dry matter. Estimates are okay. No, I just oh. said, like, if you have, like, you have lactating you, then you also have, you know, rams. Sure. Have, so it's not 
They can, I think it's, I think it's a, well, I mean, how, what are, how many numbers are you talking? Yeah, so I mean, in general, a ram needs to eat a lot less than a lactating ewe or a growing lamb. A bull needs to eat a lot less than a growing steer or a lactating cow. Um, like these are fairly generalized estimates for a whole group. Yep. Most definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Um, we do. Especially for our operation because our cattle are stockers. So we buy them and then we sell them and we want to get that weight gain because we're buying and selling on the pound. So we do monthly weigh-ins with our cattle. And then we can also see which pastures they're gaining on, which pastures we need to improve based on that. So it's like direct feedback from the animal. Yeah. It's a, there's a computer that has a battery that you can recharge, and then it's just a scale platform with load bars. We got it through Gallagher. Mm -hmm. Yep. So they shouldn't, and it's our job to make sure they don't. They, they're, they're, when it's hot, they're in the shade more, um, but there's also things that we can do um, and some annuals that we can plant to ensure that they continue to eat and gain sort of through what's traditionally that summer slump. Um, so that's a part of our mm -hmm. process that we're going through. Started to talk about it now um, in different areas that we could put some annuals in to avoid that slump because that's, it's, it's costly to think about 60 days in total that your animals are just sustaining and not necessarily gaining to finish, especially in a program like ours. Mm -hmm. grasses and Mike talked earlier about the cooler temperature, it's going to be cooler for them too. So when they lay down on the ground or they're grazing down the ground, it's going to be cooler when they lay down where the bellies are to help very stable and big ones. But I think we talked about the little bit later. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Shade? We can talk about it now. <laughs> yeah. So, that, that, but that's a part of the planning process too, is planning around July and August where the animal's going to be and to make sure they have shade access and like that. Field 40 is the first one listed, and that's kind of the one that's the big flat field we started in. But there's no shade access there. There's good water, but no shade, so we plan to not be there um, in the warmer months of the year. So there's there's some philosophies that some grazers have that shade or cattle going to shade is a learned behavior, um, and that if you exclude them from shade, they'll they won't necessarily want to go for it. But um, I don't know. There's you know you see a thousand pound animal that's panting in the sun and um, you know, give them shade and it's less stressful. And I think because stress induces kind of immune system failures and they can get sick after that. So it's not really worth the gamble of trying to prove a point. So we plan for shade for the animals when they need it. Okay. Which one? Sheep? Okay, so then this is what they each need per day for the species. So then we add that up. And that's pounds per acre of dry matter. But then we don't want them to eat everything that's out there. We want to leave some for trample and we want to leave some for regrowth. Um, so we usually double this number, and then that's about what we need for their paddock size for the day. Um, and then we'll go to our pasture and see, okay, oh, no, then we have to measure. I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> so then um, we take this grazing stick. Have ever, any, has anyone ever used one of these? No. Yeah. Okay, so the way that this works. These, or, sorry, these ahead. are usually, your extension usually has these, and they're easy to find or... I'm sure you can look them up online and order them too. Yeah, yep. this one is made by NRCS. Yeah. Yeah. So you can probably yeah. go to their website and figure out where to get one. Um, but so how this works is there's this little grid here with these dots, and you'll slide this under the canopy on the grass, 
Um, and you sort of slide it in, push some plants out of the way a little bit so you can get down, especially if the grass is really tall. And then you stand directly over it and you count how many dots that you can see. And that's going to give you a plant density on the ground. Um, and then you go to this handy dandy little chart, which on this one is rubbed off a little bit. Um, but it says the estimated pounds of dry matter per acre inch. And you see what your pasture has. So there's orchard grass and N, uh, orchard grass and clover. There's a bunch of different options here. Um, so we can say that ours is orchard grass and clover for the sake of this exercise. And let's say we saw three dots. Um, and the more dots you see, then the th that means the less dense your pasture is. Um, so if we saw three dots and it's orchard grass and clover, let's go 200 pounds per acre inch. And then, let, then we have a measuring stick here and you measure the height of your canopy and you just sort of like grab a clump and measure that. Um, and that should and, be like, sorry to interrupt, an yeah. average. Don't just go from the top height. So get an average of. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say we're at 10 inches. And then you want to do this like five times throughout your pasture. So usually what we'll do is we'll go out there before we start setting up any net. And we'll just toss it in five different directions, make these calculations. And then from there, we can determine what our paddock size is going to be. Um, so then we have 2,000 pounds per acre, pounds per acre. Um, so then because they're going to need about 5,000 pounds per acre and we have 2,000 pounds per acre, then we're going to have to give them about two to three acres a day. And we've been, and that's, that's been about average yeah. um, for us. So we, we typically split that up into two paddocks for the day. Um, so they'd get like an acre and a quarter, acre and a half or yeah. something twice a day. Um, so these, the calculations and numbers are valuable to have and to know, but also be in a position to look at your stock and evaluate. And if they're still hungry, give them more or move them an extra time. Um, I think try to get away from the philosophy of your, um, you know, when we go through this grazing system, it, it, a lot of people say that it looks like you're wasting grass because we're trampling so much, but that the wasted grass is so valuable as feed to the soil and um, cover for the ground. So to give them an extra move for the day, you're lose, you could say that you're losing an acre and a half and you're gonna need that in the fall, um, but that's gonna do wonders come fall um, if you're not stressing your pastures each time and your cattle are getting properly fed. Um, so the, oh, I haven't been repeating questions. Sorry. Is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> I was just reminded of that. Um, so the, the question was, are we calculating separately the dry matter that the sheep need? Is that right or no? So, uh, okay, yeah, so the, the, the question was, are we, um, by adding sheep in, are we needing to expand the acreage or are they complementary enough to the cattle that they can, we can use the same calculations? Okay, um, so I, I think it depends on how many sheep you have. If, if you have four times the amount of sheep than you do cattle, then that calculation would be totally different. If you're adding in a few sheep to your cattle, I mean, a 100-pound ewe is going to eat three pounds of grass or something like that in a day. Um, so I think you can go through and do these calculations so you know. Um, but traditionally, sheep and cattle only compete for about 30% of the same plant and the same part of the plant. Cattle usually come in and top off the forage, and then the sheep will sort of come through and eat a little bit lower than them. So there really isn't a whole lot of competition within the paddock for the same grass that they're going to be consuming. 
especially if we're moving them fast enough that yeah. the cattle are just taking that first bite. Yeah, and it's about, it's like, we our calculations we use about 50%, but ideally we don't want them to eat any more than 30 to 50%. Um, so a third for the cattle, a third for trample, a third for um, to leave standing for habitat. For sure, and we'll talk about that later. Also, the other question I had was, um, so you said you can't, you sort of start, you came here with the season so started, if it got running. You said next season you wanted to go up to more like 90. So you wanted to, is that based on the capacity you think you're capable of based on this year's numbers? Like, is that the most you think you could have? Or is that a good, like I'm saying, is that the, are the amount of cows you want to add based on? Yeah, I understand. So the, the question was about are we are we sort of picking a number for how many cows that we want to carry or are we calculating that based on pasture performance? Um, this year we, we wanted to carry closer to 70 head of cattle and we wound up with about half that, which I think worked in our favor for a first year of trialing. Um, going up to, we'll, we'll be between somewhere between 70 and 90 for next year is sort of a calculation of the impact that we want to have on the pastures carrying capacity and what we see the potential of the carrying capacity shifting to in the pastures. So that's like a four or five part equation of how we're coming to that decision. We were under stock this year, um, I think 30, 30 cattle and 200 sheep on 320 acres is not very significant, but it was a good number for us to start this program at. Especially because we did get them on the ground a little later than we would have liked to. So because some of that material is pretty fibrous, we were moving them more quickly than we probably will next year. Together. Well, so the it was, question was why together instead of separate groups? And if it's okay, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, because I know there's, uh, we're definitely covering that. But there's, it doesn't line up with the next slide, and I have to keep up with the slides. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, what? Um, well, because the next one is a, it's one of our short films, and it's important to see. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the next, I'm going to turn it over to Leah for a while um, to talk about planning, monitoring, record keeping. The next one is the movie, whenever you want to okay. do that. So we'll wait on the movie for a minute. OK. OK. Right, should I take that? Take that. Oh. Um, OK, so for our monitoring plan for this year was basically to figure out what we want to do for next year. Um, and we started with, we did soil samples of all the pastures to get a baseline, see what was there already. Um, just, and we'll track that every year and see how that improves. At, or doesn't improve, we'll see what happens um, over the next, you know, however long we're here. Um, and so basically what that was, we, if you, anybody went to the Woods End presentation yesterday, we send all of our samples there, um, and they basically do like a suite of Everybody physical and chemical that. soil analysis and biological analysis as well. So that's like nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, pH, all those fun things. And then they actually take all of that information and they come up with a soil fertility score for the pasture based on like what they think the pasture could be and where it's at now um, and recommendations for how to work towards that. So it actually is a really great resource for vegetable farming as well and for trying to improve your pastures. Um, and then they also do like a soil, an overall soil health score too. So we took all of that information into account when planning where we are gonna put our animals. And for us, like the cattle and sheep, we knew they were going to go all over the property, but in relation to our ducks, um, we decided where they were going to go based on those soil tests. So we'll continue to do that every year and see um, how th that changes over time. Um, and then what else do we do? So then we also are teaming up with Yale, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, with a carbon sampling. So I'll hold off on that. Um, and then we do our forage tests that we go out and measure our forage. Um, and then we're also going to do some forage analysis. Um, so we'll send that off to a lab and it'll come back. And that's really important for our winter stockpile. So 
so that we can sort of see how our winter stockpiling compares to hay and how we'll you know, work with that in the future. You basically you take little samples and you send it off and they test like your fibers, your digestible fibers, uh, protein, crude protein, um, and then you can get a sense of what's it good for the animals and what's not, you know. Um, yeah, uh, and then, yeah, so that's what we did this year. Did we do anything else this year? No, right? And then we just took lots of photos, which were maybe useful in the future, but we're not sure how we're gonna utilize those quite yet. Um, but now I'll cut on the video of our carbon sampling. Wait. Forward. Backwards. Wait. Oh, one more. Got it. This? No. How do I, play? I don't know how to play the video. Should I go over there? Probably. Maybe. Yeah. Can you do it? What happens if you click on it? There we go. Oop. Oh. Healthy soil is the foundation of good stewardship as a farmer or a rancher or anyone who manages land. It needs to have roots in it. It needs to have stable aggregates. Those are conglomerates of smaller soil particles that are glued together by a biological activity in the soil that allow air in between the particles and allow water to infiltrate into the soil, but also hold on to water in times of drought. If we don't have lots of living organisms in the soil, these aggregates break down, the soil becomes like the texture of flour and packs down, becomes anaerobic and becomes unproductive. Now every living organism on this planet, whether you're a human, a cow, a plant, a bacteria or a worm in the soil, you have a lot of carbon in you. We're a carbon-based life forms in this planet. One of the biggest single indicators of soil health is the amount of carbon or organic matter you have in the soil. By taking that simple measurement, we can predict what sort of plant growth we might be able to expect and how healthy our animals are gonna be. So while carbon is of key importance in the soils, it's actually causing a lot of issues in the atmosphere trapping too much heat in the environment. The way we get carbon into the soil is by plants pulling it out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis and it going back into the soil through decomposition or through their roots. And the way that we manage the soils and the plants and our animals as farmers and ranchers and stewards of the land can impact uh, exactly how much of that carbon is stored in the soil. Soils are the largest terrestrial sink of carbon as we're facing increasing threats of climate change. If we can find novel ways of sequestering carbon, small changes in management that might make even minuscule additions of carbon to soils can have really, really large impacts. We can learn through touch, through look, through observation, but we also need to know scientifically what's happening in the soil. A lot of our understanding of soil carbon is limited by our ability to actually measure carbon at scale. Right now, if a, a producer or a land manager or a scientist wants to understand how much carbon is in the soil, uh, a sample needs to be taken in the field. That sample then needs to be dried, processed, run through laboratory equipment. Those options are, are costly, expensive, and time consuming. Yale's developed a really compact toolkit that allows us to test carbon all across the farm much more easily and much more cheaply than traditional soil sampling would. A density and fine texture that we have never been able to do before. We're calling this whole process quick carbon. Uh, so the, the kit that, uh, that we're using today is a quick carbon field sampling kit. We've developed a soil extractor that measures and extracts soils to a set depth. It includes a reflectometer, uh, a small portable device that basically measures the color of the soil. Um, and that's, that's made by a group of engineers at uh, a company called OurSci. We drill and take samples, put it in a little tray and place it into the soil reflectometer, which is connected to a cell phone that we have through Bluetooth. It 
takes readings of the color of the soil. We take a lot of information about a landscape to get a really good sense of where the carbon is, where, where are high points, where are low points. Because this technique is so inexpensive, we can return year after year to uh, remap that and uh, use that adaptively to help inform management further. If we don't work towards building health in the soil and on the land, we're not going to have land that provides food for us as human beings or income for us as farmers. We are completely tied to soil health, as is every other organism on this planet. So monitoring it and knowing how we are impacting it is of the utmost importance. Uh, Stone Barns has been really fantastic in going all in on, uh, on sampling, uh, being able to take some samples before, uh, before the cows come through in the morning or, uh, or being able to take an afternoon to go uh, and do some data collection uh, is a really amazing resource and has made it a great, uh, a great partnership, a great collaboration. Thanks for watching and learning about the innovative work we're doing here at Stone Barn Center. If you want to learn more, check out our website and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks. Yay. So I have the kit up here too. If you, maybe when we have a break, um, if you all want to go and take a look at it. But basically this is, ooh, I knew that was going to happen. Um, this is the device that we use to extract the soil. And then the soil is all collected in this little chamber right here. And then we'll transfer it to that little Petri dish um, and weigh it. And then we're keep, right now what we're doing is we're keeping all the samples and we'll send all the samples to Yale. And they're working on the model that'll, to calibrate what the spectrometer is actually reading to what the true carbon in the soil is. And they just do that by their regular lab methods of like combustion. Um, and, yeah, sort of. I think the, uh, the plan is to eventually market these things for growers because it would be a really cheap, easy way for people to measure their carbon in their soil. And that's a huge barrier for people to be able to send all those samples to the lab. It's not cheap to do that. So I think it could be really great. And the device itself isn't super expensive. So they're, that's the goal. Like they're already on the market, though. No, they're not now. So this is like the beginning stages of everything. I mean, they've been developing it for several years now. Um, but there's, we're working on it. Um, Tomcat Ranch has one out west. Uh, there's a few other places throughout the country that are starting it. And they're trying to come up with these regional models, basically. So we're doing one of those. We have over the 320 acres, we have 300 points where we're sampling from. And we'll continue to sample from those points um, for the next few years. Yeah. So when you measure, you're measure the light of the floor, Yeah. Is that not affected by, like, just this. No, because it's right, it's just on this little device. So you put the, the cat, the little petri dish in here, um, and it's all completely covered from light because the soil is covering everything. So it should be unaffected by, by light, um, just the light in the soil. Oh, the question was if on a sunny day it would on a sunny or cloudy day if that would affect the results of the spectrometer reading. And it would not, or it shouldn't at least, if you have it completely covered, uh, covering this little spectrometer. Yeah, yeah, it should be good. And the way that they come up with the sampling points too is they sort of do this random stratified sampling where they take into account like aspects, slope, location, um, soil type, and from that they come up with all the random points. So we'll have some that are 10 feet, 10 feet from each other and some that are like a mile away from each other, depending um, on those parameters. But yeah, you guys can come take a look at this afterwards if you want. Um, yeah, ideally, we would have liked to, we didn't finish all of our samples yet for this year. Um, but ideally, we would, and some of them we wanted to get samples before livestock got on the fields, just so we could have like a true baseline, um, especially for the fields that were hayed previously. So ideally, we would do this in the summer months um, before it starts to get cold and before the 
the ground starts to freeze. But I think, you know, if we're new and still working on that workflow. Um, but ideally, you would want to sample the same time every year, for sure, if you want to compare. Um, any other questions on the carbon testing? No? Before, uh, yeah. feel free to go to the next thing. Um, on the yeah. soil, like the basic soil tests and forage tests, if anyone isn't connected with your extension office, mm -hmm. that's a great resource to, they can guide you through the process or provide you with resources to do that because those are, like Leah talked about, baselines. Those are important baselines to have as a starting point and then you can track sort of where you've gone from there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is an example of some of the photos that we've tried to take in the fields. Um, and we'll go through and we'll take a, what is the O? Is this, where's the actual pointer button? The red button. Okay. This button? Oh. Um, so this would be our free graze. We'll usually take the photos right as we're setting up the paddocks. And then we'll go back in right after they leave. And we try to take it from the same location. Um, and just to see how much we've allowed them to eat down. But after doing this for mostly the summer months, we decided that maybe the post graze was a little overkill. And we just wanted to know what the paddocks looked like before we went in there. And it might be more useful instead to do a 30 day later photo when we already are starting to see that regrowth to see how the pastures are coming back in as opposed to seeing them once they've already been grazed. Or a day, depending, so but yeah. Yeah. Right. Definitely. And it was more to see like how much they were eating and what they were trampling. And in retrospect, I don't think this is the best way to do that. Um, and I think right. <laughs> we started to think about the catalog of photos that we would have after doing, if we did this twice a day for each paddock shift for a year and how likely are we to go back through 800 photos or whatever every year to track each paddock shift. So we're shifting next year towards picking a few locations and whether that's with a T post or a step in post or something. So it's from the same spot and just kind of monitoring regrowth after a month, two months, et cetera. Yeah. And generally what we found because like the pastures themselves have have the history in them so like the ones that are hate are very different from the ones that had been um had animals in it for long periods of time um, and it's more pasture to pasture differences than paddock to paddock differences so unless we're really changing the way that we're managing our animals like we decided for a week we we're going to move them only a few times as opposed to moving them twice a day then it might be important to take different photos during those times. But other than that, each pasture, we're sort of treating as one unit as opposed to each paddock. Um, so then I'm gonna go into pasture maps a little bit. Um, so this is the software that we use to keep track of everything. And for us, this is really important because we have so many different pastures all throughout the property, but also because we have so many team members, it's a really good way to communicate with each other where the animals are. Um, and with the organization as a whole, if there's tours going on and such like that, we can very easily show where the animals are. Um, and the way that this, that pasture maps works is you can create different flocks um, and different herds, and you can put in their weights, you can put in their tag numbers, and then you can combine them, separate them, depending on how things change as you go along. Um, and, and we, you can also put in like forage quality and how much and your forage inventory in pasture maps as well. We don't utilize well. We, we started to utilize to. it a little bit, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's we like, will. <laughs> yeah, but it's some, like this calculation. You go through um, pounds per acre going in, and then you can do a post graze measurement of how much you left. Yeah. Um, which I, I think ultimately we'll find what it was when we went in is more useful than trying to dig through manure and figure out what's there after we leave. Yeah, definitely. Yes. How often do you weigh them to make your estimate? The cattle? Yeah. Uh, we weigh, we try to weigh them once a month, um, and we but we have to work within our infrastructure. So we have three corrals that are functioning that we can weigh at, and usually as we hit one of those corrals, we'll weigh at that point. Um, yeah. Uh, what's the name of the software? A pasture map. Yeah. They're they're 
they're based in California, mm -hmm. but it's it's a and there's a few different tools like this or pasture management software, but um, this one we like, and they're very. It's a, still a fairly young company, and they're receptive to feedback and um, constructive criticism, things like that. Um, but they have, like Leah mentioned, it's nice when there's so many people involved, or even if it's just yourself, really, to be it, the app is on your phone. Um, so for us, all the livestock team members can have it. The programs department can have it. So there's a pretty easy visual of where animals are at and where the livestock is at. And you can do um, some of the things you can do on your phone. You can set up paddock divisions and things like that. But a lot of it is just easier to do it on the computer as well. So yeah. The question was if we use it daily, um, if we use the software daily, and we mostly do. Yeah, some, mm -hmm. if we get busy, it's a couple of times a week to go through and update things, but um, mostly daily. <laughs> but I would recommend daily, because sometimes then you have to go back and go, wait, where yeah. were they? <laughs> We, so the, the question is if we, if we put the livestock or put paddocks into the woods, um, we have sort of the, like the relationship we have with the state, most of the woods are excluded from the agreement. Um, there are pastures that have wooded areas that we can access, but we're, we're not um, specifically targeting, targeting wooded areas for rehab um, or forest management. And when we do hit those areas, we usually hit them with the goats. And not the or, pigs, yeah. Or yeah, select areas with pigs. Yeah, or pigs. Um, what else about pasture? Any other questions? No. I think is that might is it. that a good? Does anybody yeah. want to take five or ten minutes? Stretch your legs, yeah. and then we'll come back and talk more about a lot of the flirt and livestock management. Okay, are we ready to get back to it? Maybe, maybe. Shane's got a good whistle. Okay. Everybody ready? Good leg stretch. Do any sprints? Nothing? Okay. Um, okay, so now we've... Uh, 10.30, so we'll kind of see how the time goes as far as uh, this is sort of the meat of what we have to talk about. Um, so I don't want to blow through this just to get outside, but we'll kind of see how time goes uh, to still be able to do that or we're doing the pasture walk later too if we stay in here and just go through this and answer questions and stuff. I'm totally fine for either scenario. Um, so this is kind of what our grazing program looks like, or a brief overview of a photo of it. This is the, um, the water cart I was talking about. There's four totes on there, and then we leave it uphill and then gravity fed down to sock tanks with float valves. Um, this is in a field uh, It's on the far corner of the park where there isn't any water, so we haul water out there to them. Um, so flurred management, why do we do that? Um, what's the benefit of it besides people stopping on the road and asking why the, the lambs are with the cattle. Um, I used to do, uh, before here, I used to do more of a leader follower program where the, the cattle would go first and the sheep would follow behind. Um, that's fairly common. What I, that worked when it was sort of a fairly loose rotational grazing system. Um, you know, turning the animals in at 10 inches, taking them out at six, and then the sheep would come in behind. When I switched to a, more of a high stock density program, we ran into problems with pasture recovery rates. Um, the ewes and the lambs were getting kind of second and third, um, or seconds and thirds as far as forage availability, so their gain suffered. Um, so, and we were also, uh, this was in Virginia, but at the time we were having predator losses uh, pretty significantly. So I started to look at the program and say, well, why can't they just be together? Um, you know, that standardizes rest periods. It'll give us some sense of predator protection because cattle are more likely to keep a coyote out of a pasture. Um, we, had, uh, we had donkeys there at the time. We, we have guard dogs here, um, and they're very they're good at their job. Um, so it probably wouldn't be as big of an issue here. But 
Um, pasture rest standardization um, was crucial. Um, so I know that when we get off of the pasture, there's nothing else coming in behind it. So that's when our rest period starts. Um, the uh, parasite control is also important, which is uh, leader follower. It's easier to explain because the um, sheep follow behind the cattle and they're essentially, they can ingest the parasites that the cattle would leave and the parasites dead end in the lamb stomachs. Um, it's the same philosophy here, but there's also about a 40 day life cycle in those parasites. Um, so our rest periods are long enough where by the time we would come back, the cycle would have been pretty much completed. Um, and the parasites only live in shorter grass. If we're leaving our grass as taller, there's a pretty minimal risk of any parasite load. Um, we monitor that through um, FAMACHA. Anyone know what FAMACHA is? Um, so fairly um, infrequently, or when there's an opportunity to get animals up and sorted, we'll check uh, the color under their eyes. So you're basically checking for anemia. Um, there's a score of one to five. The redder the eyelid, the healthier the animal is, um, no parasite load. As you get closer to white, white is essentially death and you're too late um, in a lamb. But if it starts to get you know, a shade under pink, you would need to treat the animal. And if we treated one ewe this year for worms. Um, and that's all that we had to do. And historically, there's been a fairly low parasite load here. But there really shouldn't be any need for any chemical intervention for parasites in a grazing system like this because your rest periods are so long and multiple species combined together um, make the parasite threat pretty much nil. Um, cattle are fairly easier to tell if they get a parasite load just as far as body condition, stool. Um, your vet or um, probably not your extension agent, but your vet, can you can take fecal samples to your vet too to check for parasites um, somewhat regularly if you, if you feel that you might be at risk of that. It's better to be more proactive than that than to wait for a problem. Um, especially if you've never done it before, it's a good thing to do just to make sure where you're starting from. So I, it should be a minimum of 40 because that's sort of a parasite life cycle. So they should be, after 40 days, the parasite should have completed their cycle and there wouldn't be a risk of livestock coming back into that field to ingest them and have them affected. Yeah, so... There's more of a, I mean, there, there could be more of a risk there, but that's where having two species in together is beneficial because the likelihood of a sheep consuming the same plant that they consumed the last time they were in there is fairly low, given the amount of space that we're giving them. So it's like we would be giving this group 10 to 15 acres um, every two days, probably. So it's not an intensive acre to two acres and then coming back to that two and a half weeks later. Um, and also at that point, too, the grass is pretty high, so they're not really eating right off the ground. They're eating higher up. Yep. Uh, the question was about parasite cycles and pork. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, stacking enterprises is also important from just a, a business pr perspective. If you have a uh, cow-calf farm or just cattle, you're, you're limited in what your market can be. Um, there was a kind of an old time uh, farmer I ran into, he said, you should add three ewes for every cow that you have. Um, just the benefits that they give your pasture, the benefits that they have for the parasite cycle, and also, you know, if you have a good ewe that can give you two lambs once a year, um, you know, on top of a cow that's giving you a calf every year, the financial return you get from an ewe is typically greater uh, than you would get from a cow. So it's important to diversify your income streams you know, here we have cattle, sheep, goats, poultry, swine. That's it, I think, yeah. <laughs> um, but also to, it's, you know, to do that and where to start from, read your land a little bit and what's your landscape, what can your landscape support? Are you, you know, if you have 10 acres of open pasture and 60 acres of woods, your operation is going to look totally different from what we have. Um, you might have things that you would like to do and you can fit those in, but also what your land can support should tell you what you should be doing as well. Um, so um, this is similar to what a field would look like when we went into it. There was a slide earlier um, when Leah was talking about the photos that we used. Um, but we, there's not a ton of diversity in that field, which is, we saw that on probably a majority of the pastures that we were in. Some of the hay fields had pretty good diversity. 
but this is what we like, fairly thick, tall, lush, seed heads are fine. Um, if we have that acre and a half-ish uh, density um, for each paddock, the animals are gonna take a bite, maybe two bites of each plant and move on. Um, if you saw what the photo was, post-graze, comparatively. So we want them to leave and trample a lot and then come back to that a couple of months later. So what that's gonna do, it's gonna leave um, soil covered. It's a similar philosophy. I like to compare it to mulching in a garden. Um, you're leaving mulch over the soil to control soil temperature, erosion, and you're essentially feeding the soil um, what the animals trampled down. So a lot of that stemmy fibrous stuff that we saw starting in, like in July and August in our rotation, it's easy to say that you need to mow it because the cattle aren't going to eat it, um, but it's way more valuable as feed for the soil after you graze, and then you're not, as I mentioned earlier, if you were to mow it too early, then everything that's green and lush underneath that canopy would have been dried up. Um, let the animals pick what they want, and then they're going to trample what they don't want. If you're not putting them into a situation of forcing them to eat, they won't. Um, so, you know, even though I mentioned our gains slowed down in July and August, we still gained. We went from two and a half to three and a half pounds a day in the spring and early summer down to a pound to a pound and a half, which economically that hurts a bit if it goes much longer than two months. Um, but coming back into fall, we were up closer to like two and a half to three pounds as an average. Um, and we're, we're sort of a finishing operation here too and moving towards that. So we need to be above that two pound a day mark um, for back fat, intermuscular fat. I like over two and a half pounds for the last 90 days. Um, and again, we monitor that through monthly weigh-ins with the cattle and we can sort of check and adjust our paddock sizes and fields that they're gonna go into or that we might skip based on what's in there and depending on where we're at with our harvest schedules. And running them through that fibrous material as opposed to mowing it too because we are investing in these pastures in the long term. Um, having that nutrient load on there for that thatch also helps to decompose those grasses faster than if we had just mowed it and let it sit out there by itself. Um, okay, so in an, another part, like just to add on to what I said about leaving grass on the pasture, we're providing a habitat for the pastures that's conducive to grass growth. Um, a set stock scenario or a, um, you know, if we were to have 40 cows out in a 25 acre pasture for a season, um, and then you know, mow that every few weeks just to keep the weeds down. It's a, a somewhat of a common management philosophy. 95% of the farms in the country do that. Um, and it works for them as they do that. But you know, what you run into then is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, grass plant starts to regrow within three days. So a cow or a ewe or whatever is gonna go back to that new regrowth every three to five days because the sweet stuff is what tastes best. You only do that a few times because it's going to stress the roots so much that it's eventually going to kill the plant. Um, so by increasing the density and moving them more often, they really truly are only getting that one bite and then the, the plant can rest and recover for the duration of its growth cycle instead of continuously stunting it. Um, if you do that for too long as the plants sort of continuously die, then your plant spacing, your plant density decreases and you get more bare dirt, um, which is our enemy because there's a, there's a seed bank underneath every single one of these pastures and we want to provide the environment to promote the seeds that we do want. If you're continuously grazing and set stocking, exposing bare dirt, soil naturally wants to fix itself. So, you know, thistle, mugwort, horse nettle, other things that animals typically don't eat or aren't the best forage are going to start to come up to try and fix itself. So weeds and forbs are other things that are, it's a symptom of management. Um, so, and as we, and that was a big thing that we went through this year is we started to see symptoms of management. There was, and other things that they may not have seen here previously because they mowed um, fairly often. And so they, like, in a conversation earlier, we had a lot of foxtail and horse nettle this year. Um, we had that. If we focus on that and focus on only eliminating that, what are we doing to the rest of the pastures? So focus on what you want and focus on the environment that you want to create instead of what you want to get rid of. If you're only focusing on getting rid of horse nettle, you're going to get rid of it, but then you're going to sort of lose sight of the bigger picture of creating a, a healthy and diverse pasture ecosystem. Yeah, and to bring our management back to soil, because that's my favorite, um, as they take that first bite off of the top, it's basically everything on the top of the plant is being mimicked in the roots of the plant. So you can imagine they take that bite off the top, there's a little bit of root dieback that is staying in the soil, adding to the carbon in the soil. 
And then as that grows, the roots are growing back, and that'll make a stronger root system at the end of the period, too. <laughs> so I like to see uh, we had we had a fair amount of like really prime horse metal stands this year. Like <laughs> if we could harvest that, we would have made a lot of money. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a time and place for animal impact and animal density where it can have a benefit on the soil. We're in a situation that we need to continuously put weight on animals and we have lactating ewes and growing lambs. We don't always have that flexibility, like dry cows, you could do that with. Um, I like to, that's where I like to use hay. We don't make hay here, um, just for a nutrient cycling perspective. But um, if you, in the winter, um, when you get into a period where you need to feed some hay, you can put them in that, those areas and feed hay in there. You're introducing nutrients, manure, in a compact space, seed heads, um, that's already in the hay. And then from there, you should start to see a shift in the biology of the soil and um, some new species start to be introduced after that. But I don't think you're gonna get that unless you can get impact and you can't get impact when the nettle's there because there's nothing else for the animals to eat. The question was about uh, if there's a pure stand of horse nettle. <laughs> Um, okay, so another video, that's fun. Uh, this one is shorter, and this is uh, it's an overview of some of the things I talked about, but it, what? Oh, that was me. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, go ahead, please, thank you. <laughs> Early on in the discussions of how we wanted to manage the land that's now under our care, it became very clear to us that the logical solution was to use ruminants, specifically cattle and sheep, to graze through these pasture lands, control the growth, and also build the health and biodiversity of the soils and the forages. We're allowing these grasses to grow and flourish really for the first time in 40 to 50 years. Uh, these fields have been set stocked, hayed, mowed for quite a long time. So to see these fields express themselves and grow for the first time is really encouraging. We're utilizing two species together in the same paddock, the cattle and the sheep. That serves multiple benefits for us. We're not managing multiple different groups spread throughout the farm. It standardizes our pasture rest periods as well. So we can have one group controlling the density um, and the impact that we're seeing on these one and a half to two acre plots that we're putting them in. Having these two together eliminates the need for any chemical wormers. Uh, they essentially worm themselves. Think back to how animals would have roamed the prairies a long, long time ago. There would have been larger animals followed by smaller animals and smaller animals and birds and uh, different wildlife would have been behind them, which is what this grazing is also promoting. What's been really encouraging and what we, what we want to see and what we're trying to do in these fields uh, to allow these grasses to grow when the cattle come through and the sheep come through, they're going to graze the top part of this and they're actually gonna do a lot of trampling. Um, which is one of the effects of having a large group of animals for a short period of time. So this stemmy material is going to get trampled onto the ground, um, leaving us with thatch that's going to cover the soil. And it's, it's the same concept as mulching, uh, if you were to think about that in your garden, for example. We're keeping the soil covered to control soil temperature, erosion. Uh, we're, inc we're increasing the density of the plants as we go along too, because all of these seeds are going to be going back into the soil to make contact with what is now bare soil. Um, once that starts to change and the biodiversity in the soil increases and dung beetles and earthworms start to increase, that's when we really start to see the benefit of this grazing management. Thank you for watching. Please visit stonebarncenter.org slash grazing for more information about our grazing project. Okay. Evidently only on one shirt. <laughs> I, didn't <plan> <laughs> um, I didn't plan that. I'm not that weird. I'm weird, but not that weird. So, uh, that was, some of that was redundant, but that's uh, a pretty succinct overview for the program. Um, before I move into, how are we on time? Uh, good. Um, about landing, any, any more grazing questions that I didn't get to, or that we didn't get to? Um, 
So the, the question was if we want consistency within our pastures or if each field um, is different and what, what we prefer. What, what we want is diversity. We're trying to get away from a monoculture. Um, the more species that we have in a field, the healthier the animals are going to be if they can get 20 different plants in you know, the course of an hour or so of grazing. That's what we want. Um, I think there are certain fields that we may need to introduce some singular species mm -hmm. to get more diversity in the end. Um, like there were some areas we saw this winter that were fairly heavily stocked for winter um, areas for the cattle that were, we, they drilled in the spring. Um, it was a good solid stand in the spring and then it just turned to crud yeah. <laughs> <laughs> after that. And there, there was a couple of areas where we saw that. And so we, you know, we make note of that and then we plan for next year. But um, ideally there's a huge amount of diversity within each field, but that takes I sort of see this as a, a minimum of a three-year turnaround to get the fields to a point where each one is going to be productive in a finishing environment. Um, but it takes time. Yeah, for sure. Because each field has had its own separate use, whether it was hay or set stock or mowed or whatever the situation is. Um, you know, I, but I don't want each field to be the same either, because there are certain fields that we use for winter grazing that I won't use in the summer. Um, so species diversity is important there. Yep. Sure. Um, so the question was if we could talk more about winter stockpile um, in our system for doing that. Um, so stockpiling is, there, there, I have a few different philosophies on it. Um, the, the basic concept is using a forage that is toxic to the animals in the summer um, and then saving that until after you get a hard frost and continuing to graze that instead of feeding hay. Um, so the, to, to back up a little bit, it's fescue is the most common grass that stockpile, or Kentucky 31. Um, it's what's common in most lawn mixes. And um, it was introduced, I think, in like the 50s-ish um, as, a, as a grass that'll grow anywhere. Um, and it does, so it's an invasive and it, it can take over a field pretty quickly. Um, the problem is that it contains an endophyte that's toxic to most animals in the heat. Um, so after you get into July and August, it's going to be in pastures that you don't want to graze. Um, it can do it, it does numbers on an animal's endocrine system, so it raises their body temperature. It can cause cows to abort. Bulls can go sterile. Um, feet problems start to come up, and they they just like they're hot and unthrifty. Um, we had the first time I had a situation when I was starting out where grazing animals on fescue in the summer they had shade access the density was too high um, and so there was like a string of issues that came up our conception rates were like 35 percent um, for that breeding season because we were trying to shift breeding seasons to have calving start in may but the problem with that is then you're grazing in the heat of the summer so um, you know mistakes present learning opportunities which indeed that was so um, you know, there's a few different ways you can go about stockpiling. One of them is if you have if you have specific areas that you want to be in um, for the winter, you can set those aside no matter what's there. Um, another one is I sort of use like um, August 1st as a benchmark for when we would start a stockpiling system. So I wouldn't graze a field after the first of August, the middle of August at the latest, um, letting that field grow until you get a hard frost. Um, but when it's the first or the 15th of August, it either needs to be grazed short or clipped fairly short. So there's sort of a level playing field. If you go, I've tried to do it earlier, and I found if you go earlier, the fescue is sort of ranky by the time you would come to it in the winter. So it's, it's helpful um, to go as close to August as you can. Um, when you get a hard frost, it turns more nutritious than hay, which is where the forage analysis comes in handy. You can compare that to the hay that you have. Um, and then you can determine if you want to feed any hay first or if you're going to graze your stockpile first. Um, it's, it's financially beneficial, obviously, to feed as less hay as you can. Um, it's, it's expensive to make, uh, expensive to buy. And if we can shift our management philosophy a little bit um, to be able to stockpile, you can do that. There's also another method of like a whole farm stockpiling. So in, we, here we set aside... 50 acres, yeah. maybe, um, and we'll probably be through with that by the end of the month. Um, so as you go forward, you ideally want to be in a scenario where you're improving every year. Um, 
like two months is a good benchmark for how much hay that you should be feeding in kind of a financially viable system. Um, feeding no hay is awesome too. Um, but it's a, like a nutrient cycling concept. And if you, if you do a whole farm stockpile, you're essentially giving every pasture the same amount of rest instead of setting aside 80 acres and then putting stress on the rest of your farm. So if you can include those 80 acres in the rotation, but graze them with less density, and you're not, uh, um, I found that works. So it's, there's no science behind it, but I'm just telling you that it worked for me <laughs> to do that. Um, so, it, so yeah, then you keep those fields in your rotation and then you end up grazing till about the same time, um, but you're giving your pastures more of a chance to rest during the summer and fall, which can be somewhat of a stressful time for regrowth. Um, but here we're doing, we're, we set aside th that acreage more so because it's around where we want to have animals centered for the winter than anything else, because we can't, we can, but we don't want to be out on the trails during the winter and kind of doing damage to the trails when there's snow melt and ice and um, those kind of things that we didn't want to get involved in. Yep. And then are you picking these areas to do hay based on where you're wanting to run wheat? You're talking about when you use the hay, and like what are your criteria for picking like sacrifice areas for competition and then having them in there? So get away from sacrifice area. <laughs> Um, there's, there's areas where you can add nutrients, and that, that's how I like to look at hay feeding. Um, it's, a, it's a tool in your toolbox. Every grazing style, think of it as a giant toolbox, and you can select what you want to use. Um, I, don't, I don't like to say that we use high density all the time or mob grazing all the time. You have to be adaptive to what your animals need and what feedback you're getting from your fields and climate conditions. And there's, we went through a hot stretch this year where we had, you know, we gave them a spot for four or five days or something like that. So. Um, if, if you use hay feeding as a part of your toolbox, identify areas where there's nettle um, or other things that you may want to introduce some more impact or nutrients to where you wouldn't have been able to during the grazing season. If, yeah, the question was if we roll out our hay. If you can get uh, um, round bales, it's easy to roll them out so you're spreading out nutrients across the entire field instead of having feeders concentrated and um, kind of mucking up individual spots. So rolling them out, and you're not wasting hay. Whatever hay they lay on is, it's the, the cost of hay is cheaper than any fertilizer you can put on your field. So it's just organic matter. Good question. Uh, the, the, the question was, how are we doing fencing in the winter? We have, <clears throat> there's a hard fence around most of the fields that we're using throughout the winter. Um, we have temporary electric. We also have sort of a courtyard barn area if we get into a, a huge snow event. Um, that we can bring animals into if we need. And I think that's more for our access to them than for them not being able to be out in the elements. Are you the The question was if we're spreading any minerals based on soil tests for what the pastures need. The only thing, and you can speak to it more, but that we're, we're targeting areas for with poultry. Um, we're not we're not putting any other inputs on the fields, but fields that were low in phosphorus yep. is where we're putting the ducks and the layers. Um, and for effic efficiency sake, next year we're going to, I think, combine those two groups in the same field. They were sort of spread out at opposite ends, which makes for awkward inefficiencies. And the idea behind that too being we want to see what the animals can do on their own, and then if we decide that we do need to add some minerals, then we can do so. But for the first few years, at least see what, what the changes will occur just with the livestock. And that's sort of a, a loose philosophy around this program, is to, to monitor and track what our management is doing over the course of the first three years without too much interaction from remineralization or seeding. Um, you know, I, I mentioned there's a few areas that we're targeting for seeding to get a quicker turnaround um, to make the areas more productive, but there's nothing, um, there's not a rush to get the pastures productive now so we can be in a situation where we can monitor and get feedback. Yep. So the, the question was the negatives about rolling out the hay. The, the negative, I think, would be if you get into mud um, and then you're doing more damage than good if your pastures are too wet. Um, the, there's a few different ways you can do it. There's a tractor. Um, you can put the bale on top of the slope and roll it down and hopefully your aim is good and it doesn't roll into a fence. <laughs> uh, 
Um, mm -hmm. You can, uh, there's a, a bale unroller that hooks up to the back of the tractor too. It's got hydraulic arms that can pick up a round bale and you just drive forward and rolls as you drive. Um, there's also trucks that have the same setup on the back of a flatbed. It can pick up round bales um, and unroll them at the same time, but not in mud. You get, I got stuck a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but as you start rolling, the cows usually come by and help you too. <laughs> And so the, the question was about diversity and the nutrient load and the pastures. And I, th I think the only reason that the hay fields had more diversity is because they were seeded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other fields that were sort of heavily stocked for the winter weren't necessarily. They, they had, there were dedicated feeding pads with asphalt millings and feeders set up in there that the cow, that they would feed the cows in. Yeah. So the nutrient load was heavy in those, in the fields that they were aggressively feeding in compared to the hay fields, which were probably being soil tested, fertilized, right. amended, and seeded. Yeah. But the plant spacing in the hay fields was incredibly huge. Um, in a bad way, yeah. yeah. Fair soil. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, what is your ultimate deep cell? Like, are you moving around planting and storing things in the front row? Just some uh, like techniques you can play with. And then how are you moving around? Deep cell. We have deep cell batteries, and it's a 18 joule stay fixed charger hooked up to a deep cell battery. Um, and the batteries we, we sort of routinely replace every four days or so just to make sure they don't. We get to a point where there's no charge on the fence. I think deep cells work better if you can draw them all the way down and then recharge. Um, but yeah, we have that. It's like in a plastic tote that we have that set up in. Um, you could set up a solar charger to constantly recharge the battery, but that it's cumbersome if we're if we're moving that often. So we it's easier for us just to bring batteries back to the shop and charge them. Um, but we also have uh, there's that set up for the main group. We have briefcases from Premier that have a solar charger. Um, and then we have a couple of other smaller ones that don't do a whole lot. So they do put out some. Yeah, but the, that big one is the one we use for the main group. Yeah, and because we're running so much net, we really need that big charge in order to charge it at all. <laughs> do you mow for your electronic line, or do you just drive it all day? We, we drive it. We mowed once. Yeah. So this is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah, the question was about if we mow a path to put up the net and the electronet and stuff, but. Yeah, we just we drive a path in the Kubota and drop net as we drive, and so the grass is so the, like it's way more efficient. And you know the mowing was sometimes spotty, and it just takes too much time. Yes. And some some of the fields have it. The, the question was if there's a perimeter fence throughout the, the farm. And so some of the fields have it, some of them don't. That's why we use, we, as sort of a standard, we just use the Electronet everywhere now. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yep. Yeah, so we're, now we're slaughtering. Question. Oh, so the question was. <laughs> Um, what percentage of our summer fleur do we keep during the winter for overwintering? Um, and we, so we have all of our lambs, and right now we're in the process of slaughtering them. So our lamb, our flock is definitely getting smaller, but we'll continue to slaughter throughout the spring. Um, so that def that shrinks, but our ewes we all keep, um, and then we have our rams separate. And in terms of cattle, we are keeping all of our cattle. It's, we're, we're planning to overwinter between 12 and 15, and that's, yeah. that's sort of a changing target right now. Yeah. Some other, other variables at play, but 12 to 15 was our initial goal on how many we would keep for the winter with the idea of slaughtering those uh, in the spring, early spring through July or August. Okay, um, so we'll talk about uh, 11 o'clock. How many would like to go out and we can sort of continue this in the field, or do you guys want to stay in here? 
What, what's the read on the group? Okay. Outside was the majority? Um, okay, are there any more questions in here while we're here that you're hot burning issues? Otherwise we can pack up and, yes. yeah, go ahead. So the, the question was about pushing the lambing date back. How does, that, how does that change the animals that were overwintering and the cost of winter feed compared to the choice to lamb later? Um, it's sort of always theoretically a moving target. I like butchering lambs. I like to happen at about eight to 10 months. Um, we have a, a, a live weight goal between 90 and 100 pounds at that time. So that gives us a hang weight around 50. I don't like to go much below like 46, 45, and up to 60 is good. Um, consistency is important for us with the way that we sell, whether it's through the store, about half goes to the restaurant. Um, so theoretically, most should be butchered December, January, before we would have to get into feeding too much hay. Um, and they actually, they finish really well on stockpile. Um, the fat coverage is great, and they, they, like, once we get onto stockpile, there's a huge jump in weight gain, whether it's sheep and cattle. Okay. Um. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>